Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Abbas Aminat, who is William Graham Sumner Professor of History at Yale University and the director of the program in Iranian Studies at the Macmillan Center. He has taught and written about early modern and modern history of Iran, the Muslim world, the Middle East, and the Persianate world for more than three decades. Today, we'll talk with Professor Aminat about his new book titled, Iran, A Modern History. It's an impressive tome of nearly 1,000 pages that tells the compelling history of Iran from 1501 to 2009. And it's been widely reviewed worldwide by a number of publications, including the New York Review of Books and the Times of London. Welcome, Professor Aminat. Thank you, thank you for your very complimenting introduction. Well, you have quite a uh, quite an impressive um, career span, so I think that's Thank important you. to note that. And let's start with the book. It is quite an impressive um, undertaking. Give us an overview. Well, this has been a book in making for quite a long time, mm -hmm. for probably two decades, or if you start from the inception of the book, even longer. Uh, initially, uh, Yale Press, Yale University Press, uh, was looking for a book on modern Iran since they had published one before by Professor Kedi, and they wanted to up update and get a new one. Mm -hmm. So we, we thought that uh, we, I can produce a book for about 300 pages. But uh, as it turned out, uh, over the course of years, my thinking about how this book should be organized changed. Uh, since most of the books that are written about modern Iran, and there are several of them, um, and there is nothing wrong, of course, they all start the modern period, since they, they isn't the title, it's usually referred to as modern Iran, with the 20th century, perhaps with the rise of the Pahlavi dynasty in around 1920s, or sometimes if they are a little bit more generous, start with the turn of the 20th century with the constitutional revolution in Iran. And the story is taken from there on. Uh, my uh, intention was to really to look further backward and look, write something which the French historians would call it long durée, going further back into history to the early modern period at least uh, in order to try to explore uh, some of the uh, what might call origins or the roots of modernity or obstacles to modernity as, as a matter of fact to try to put into perspective the events of the 20th century most significantly in the case of this book return to 1500s, that is the beginning of the 16th century, with the rise of the Safavid Empire mm -hmm. of Iran and with the declaration of Shiism as the official religion of the state. Both these, the territorial re reorganization of the empire under a, uh, a guarded domains of Persia, mm -hmm. then its name, uh, and the idea of Shiism being its uh, 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 religion of the state had a uh, tremendous long-term implications for what emerged later on in the 19th and the 20th centuries. So that basically is part of the argument or the rationale why this book has taken such a long uh, time frame and uh, it has so many pages. Right, right. So it is a, a very huge undertaking. How did you do the research for it? And how long did it take you to write it? Well, it, in the, I've been re writing this book for close to two, de two decades, I must mm -hmm. say. And uh, sometimes rather frustrated when it's going to come to an end, and, you know, writing chapters of the chapters and never realizing the end, the t uh, light mm -hmm. at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but it was a kind of a pleasure and at the same time pain mm -hmm. um, of, uh, of rewriting the history of this long period of time. The research for it uh, was, in a sense, a lifetime mm -hmm. research. 
my earlier, now I'm beginning more to realize that what I had done earlier on in my first book about the uh, ap apocalyptic and uh, messianic movements in 19th century is mostly about religious history of Iran in the, in the course of the 19th century. Um, my second book is, or rather my third book, is The Pivot of the Universe is about the really the political structure of the country. Mm -hmm. And not only the country, but country in connection to the world around it. Uh, this is the pivot of the universe, which is really a biography of a ruler in the latter half of the 19th century. And my third book, the one that you and I had a conversation about, is back again to the issues of apocalyptic movements in Iran, Iranian history over a long period of time. So there was already a groundwork mm -hmm. for something like this to be done, but never I'd done this as systematically as before. But I've made certain decisions very early when I started writing this book. For one thing, I felt that if I would like to add footnotes to this book extensively, it has a number of mm -hmm. uh, footnotes and quotations, citations that is, uh, it would uh, make this book even bigger. Uh, and perhaps also keeping in mind the kind of audiences that would be interested to read this book. Mm -hmm. I felt probably if I relegate all of the information about the sources to the very end of the book, that would make things easier. So there is, as you can see in this book, a fairly hefty section uh, called Further Readings. And they've gone over chapter by chapter, almost section by section in this book, and provided an annotated bibliography. So it said, this book is about this subject, and said a few words about it in mm -hmm. uh, cases that are actually more important. So in a sense, uh, I try to avoid using any primary sources in Persian, because I felt for an English reader or European reader, not Chinese reader, because there's a Chinese edition coming out. Mm -hmm. It is uh, probably is not much of a use if I give them all the primary sources but 18th century history of Iran. Mm -hmm. um, whoever wants that kind of sources has to consult um, other uh, research tools which are available and to which I have referred. Mm -hmm. So as far as the uh, uh, research on my own case is concerned. Well, parts of it was kind of easier mm -hmm. uh, since uh, I have already was well uh, informed or I hope I have been mm -hmm. well informed about the period. Yes. Uh, but the two ends of it, namely the 16th and 17th centuries and then from the middle of the uh, for, from the uh, second quarter of the 20th century to the present mm -hmm. are areas for which I had to do more readings. Okay. Um, and uh, that is what would take a uh, very long period of time to try to prepare myself and try to uh, look at it. Uh, and that's another in indication, that's another characteristic of this book, is that it's not really a political history. I intentionally try to break through the conventional barriers between what usually referred to as political history, mm -hmm. social history, or rather socioeconomic history, and cultural history. As you can see, this book uh, sometimes, at times, intentionally tends to break through these barriers. And mm -hmm. you have a section, as you can see, all the chapters, 17 chapters are in this book. The four parts, 17 chapters, and each chapter is divided into subsections. Uh, all of them are uh, titled in the mm -hmm. book, although they don't appear in the table of contents. But what you would see that in every section, uh, for instance, I've talked about the political history of the 17th century, what I felt that it's bare minimum that it's necessary for a, uh, for a reader. Mm -hmm. But then I'd given say, for instance, the history of material culture, how arts and architecture evolved, how, uh, how intellectual trends came about. And I'm not trying just to add them in order for this to be there, but mm -hmm. there is a, actually 
uh, uh, there is an actual uh, rationale for all of these uh, uh, sections to follow one another. For instance, in the case of the uh, 17th century, which is a period of uh, great importance in philosophical speculation mm -hmm. in Safavid Iran, uh, I have raised questions about the exploration of the notions of modernity in comparison to Europe of the same time period, mm -hmm. whether a uh, Iranian philosopher, Mullah Sadra, very well known, uh, can be compared to Spinoza. Are these ideas traveled around, whether because Iran was in contact with uh, the Netherlands, with Holland at the time, through the Dutch East India Company, whether some literature has been transferred back and forth. Mm -hmm. So these kind of questions that I've raised my, uh, that does not have much to do with the political history directly, but indirectly plays a part in That's the so way that the society at. is shaped. Or for instance, in the case of 18th century, uh, much debate has been uh, uh, in the literature of the, in the scholarly lit literature of the 18th century is about the downfall of the Safavid Empire, mm -hmm. which is one of these three Muslim empires of the early modern times, along with Mughal Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And the case of the Safavid collapse or decline and collapse has raised many questions. There are two or three books about the subject, mm -hmm. you know, the scholarly books. And I tried to look at some areas where less attention has been paid and probably they're more important, including, for instance, ecological changes that mm -hmm. came about in the 18th century. It's this uh, so-called age of uh, the, the Little Ice Age uh, at uh, the uh, from the early decades of the 18th century on to the end. That had an impact in the agrarian societies of Iran. Okay. And the uh, movements of the uh, nomadic population, that had immediately impact on the political instability of the 18th century Iran. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, after, all, after that, I argued that the 18th century brought about a major gap between uh, the Middle East in general, Iran in particular, and the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the West. So um, I've explored reasons why there is a, uh, um, if you like, a gap in terms of the, uh, in terms of military power, in terms of the economic output, in terms of exploration of the world. The reasons for that goes really back to the material culture or to the way that these societies were weakened in the course of mm -hmm. the 18th century. Interesting. Let me ask you this, as someone who's basically spent their life looking um, or studying the history of Iran, when you were doing the research you had mentioned, you looked um, at the, the two end caps of time, so the, the very early period and the, the more recent period. When you were doing the research um, for both those times, did you come across anything that um, surprised you or you weren't expecting or you know did you learn something that made you say wow you know yes. I just didn't expect that yes well let me preamble that by saying that at the time when I signed the contract with Yale University Press my publisher said okay you are writing this book try to answer this one important question why at the latter part of the 20th century after 70, 80 years of um, basically a trend towards secularization of the state and to some extent the society, we end up with a theocratic uh, regime, mm -hmm. a, an Islamic revolution, and what does that mean? So, okay, that was very much in my mind, not necessarily because the editor had told me, but that's something that really uh, engaged me. In the, we, and then you ask, what is that surprised you? Probably one of the major themes that uh, even was, uh, for me, uh, a revelation after even all these years of teaching courses on modern Iran, is that how much this interaction between the state and the religious establishment is so crucial mm -hmm. in the shaping of Iran. Can this, you cite an example of that to help yes. us understand? You know, uh, there, there has been in 
ancient times or late antiquity actually, a theory that it's often been associated with the Persian theory of government, mm -hmm. in which the two uh, institutions of the state and the religious establishment were considered as two sisters, as two inseparable sisters mm -hmm. actually, that the very instability, uh, the very stability of the society uh, is based on the collaboration and harmony between the, these two institutions, these two columns upon which the society is the rests. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably a very conservative idea, uh, which is very contrary to the American modern no notion of the separation of the church and the state. Mm -hmm. Here is basically the idea is that these two in institutions have to uh, reinforce each other. Right. So uh, what happens is that uh, in this 16th century, we see that the Safavid states very, very deliberately nurtures and, uh, and gives power and place and respect and a great deal of authority and endowments to a religious establishment, Shi'i religious establishment that it creates. Mm -hmm and it becomes part of the institution of the state. So there are judges, there are uh, jurists, there are schools pretty much like law schools in Western uh, examples. Uh, there are colleges, they are all basically supported and built by the state or by uh, uh, nobility who like the Oxbridge system in England or like colleges such as ours in this country, mm -hmm. uh, very much depends in this kind of endowments. So there is a close association between the institution of the state and uh, the uh, religious institution, the jurists, the doctors of law, those that are really engaged, the theologians. Mm -hmm. uh, although Shi Islam, contrary to Sunni Islam, had never really developed its same kind of an official hierarchy. Okay. It's a it's resisted hierarchy, as I've explained in this book. Now, over the course of time, between 16th century, when it's the beginning of this process, and 19th century, there is a major change. The change is that these two, two institutions, that one is really relies on the other, mm -hmm. that is that the religious establishment relies on the state, by the 18th century are somewhat separated from each other. They still support each other, mm -hmm. but the course of events, mostly the, uh, the uh, civil war in the course of the 18th century, the, uh, the weakening of the post-Safavid period, the weakening of the state, allowed this religious establishment to develop somewhat semi-autonomously. Still fully supportive of the state, but autonomous mm -hmm. in terms of its own re uh, resources, it had its own endowments, it uh, uh, attracted um, religious arms from the public, independent from the state, pretty much like this Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. okay. So they did the same, still remained pretty an anarchic in their social structure, in their uh, institutional structure. Uh, and. Uh, in collaboration with the state. This is the second step. Mm -hmm. Up to here, for me, was pretty much ev obvious that this is the process I think. The, the, the aspect that really surprised me in my research, as I did more in the 20th century, is that <clears throat> as a result of modernity and the process of secularization after the Constitutional Revolution at the turn of the 20th century, mm -hmm. which is a very important event, Unfortunately, not much is known about it in the West. This was much more than a constitutional revolution. It was a real full-blown full revolution at okay. the turn of the 20th century. The society turned more secular, particularly the middle classes. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, in the post-constitutional period, during the First World War, post-First World War, led to the creation of a more secularizing state, that's the Pahlavi state. Mm -hmm. And the Pahlavi state really, the emergence of the state, public education, uh, the new judiciary, all of various institutions that there are a number of them, that were the, under the control of the 
clerical establishment mm -hmm. uh, was taken away from them. So, and that's the new part that, although one knows, but one, one, once you read about it and uh, see the reactions of the religious clerical establishment towards that kind of a change is very remarkable. Basically, in the 20th century, they are more and more isolated. They were sent back to their colleges. Mm -hmm. They were still had a fair number of their seminarians who were working with them. But the nature and the, ad, the, the nature of their exercise of uh, uh, scholarship and their attitude towards the state gradually changes. They become more hostile, more critical mm -hmm. towards the state than any time before. So they no longer are party to the, um, uh, to the st stability of the society mm -hmm. with the state. The state don't needs them, don't, doesn't need them anymore mm -hmm. because it has its own institutions, because it has its own, own resources. And part of the reason why it has its own resources is the fact that the discovery of the oil in the Middle East basically, no matter the very painful history of oil nationalization, provided I Iran, as in many other countries in the region, with a, uh, a certain degree of uh, uh, a certain degree of autonomy, uh, e economic autonomy, mm -hmm. which n does did not require any more uh, the support or the approval of a, uh, what it's been defined as a backward religious establishment mm -hmm. which is conservative, reactionary, doesn't want to go along with the values of a secular society. Mm -hmm. And that in, in the long term, by the end of the 20th century, by the last quarter of the 20th century, turns into almost a revolutionary movement mm -hmm. and is the very foundation of what we would find as an Islamic revolution. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the conservative establishment of the earlier times turns into a radical revolutionary movement. That's what I have discussed at length mm -hmm. in my book. Okay. That's an interesting development yes. that still has not uh, fully played uh, out. Fully yeah. played out. Mm -hmm. Because if you look, that's the first time in the course of Iranian history, perhaps in the course of Middle Eastern history, uh, or the course of Islamic history, one might say, that a religious establishment has taken over the institution of the state. Mm -hmm. Never before it has ever happened. So this phenomenon, how it's going to play out in future, now we are at this next year is the 40th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. What's going to happen from here on? Of course, I haven't covered it in my book, mm -hmm. but that's the topic that is basically right. Uh, for, the, for its roots, we have to go back and right, look at right. this book. So in looking at, over the course of the 500 years that you cover in the book, um, I, I'm sure you've seen some patterns that have mm -hmm. evolved. In fact, you allude to um, such in your introduction. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that and also what you feel are some of the really critical events that took place over the course of that time period to make Iran what it is. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, one that I've just pointed out, mm -hmm. the relation between the state and the religious establishment is one. Mm -hmm. uh, is one of these trends, but it's not the only one. Uh, if I want to name a few, uh, Iran has a very clear sense of uh, what it refers to as boom and bar. Boom meaning the center, bar meaning the periphery. So the idea of center versus periphery is ingrained into uh, the Persian uh, or Iranian uh, political culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you go back even to the Shahnameh, the Book of the Kings, you see that this, this is the text that goes back to pre-Islamic period, written 8,000 years ago, and still many of the stories, the myth, basically reasserts this idea that there is always a center, there is a periphery. The significance of that is that the mode of the government that dominated Iran for a very long time, up to the 20th century, is this negotiation between the center and the periphery. Mm -hmm. That's why the name of Iran was always referred to as the guarded domains of Iran. 
it was not one domain, it was domains. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the duty of the state is to, to protect these domains, but it gives them a certain degree of semi-autonomy. It's a kind of federal system mm -hmm. um, that allows a degree, because of the terrain, because the way that Iran as a land um, uh, cannot be ruled like, let's say, France or Netherlands or even, although even in this uh, uh, European country, or the United States is a very good mm -hmm. example of how you cannot have an entire control from this center that is always balanced off by the, by the, peri by the peripheries or, if you like, by the federal system. Mm -hmm. So that's a major theme that you can see. There is another important theme that, again, if you're asking about surprises, mm -hmm. you can see throughout this book, dominates basically throughout this book, is the fact that there is a concept of the self and the other. Like most other nations, you know, all the nations in the world, if you look at their history, there is always a self, there is always an other. Uh, it's sometimes geographical, it's sometimes cu cultural, it's sometimes political, it's sometimes a combination of them. Mm -hmm. In the Iranian case also, this is a very clear cut. There is the term Iran, which is ancient times, it's a reference to the land. Okay. versus an Iran, the lands that are not Iran. So if you go back even to the mythology of the Shahnameh, again, you can see that the distinction between the two is very clearly made. There's always some people out there that are not Iranians, and there are some kind of a threat to the very existence of the center. That's why, indeed, in this book, you can see that why Shiism being declared as the state religion is important in the 16th century. It's not by the way unusual because it happens, let's say in Habsburg uh, Empire, Spain, mm -hmm. when Catholicism was declared as the, and of course Inquisition and the rest. The same phenomenon perhaps to some extent, perhaps as a reaction to Iran, happens in the Ottoman Empire mm -hmm. that declares itself as the Sunni power. Okay. Okay. So Shiism is important in this regard because these forces of the non-Iran on the frontiers always seem to threaten, or, or the Iranians, people inside, always felt that these are threats from the outside. Mm -hmm. So the sense of the other is always associated with the sense of insecurity, right. and therefore, there is a need for domestic internal cohesion, and that cohesion comes through a religious idea. That's the ideology that brings about the cohesion mm -hmm. inside. Now, in reality, what you see that, uh, uh, that for, from the 1600 uh, onwards, Iran faces these and Iran, these forces on its frontiers. Mm -hmm. The most significant, the most powerful, obviously is the Ottoman Empire in its western frontiers. Uh, it's a Sunni versus, versus the Shi'i Iran, mm -hmm. and of course the Uzbeks and the Afghans and the other Sunni semi-settled uh, populations or the states in its northwest, northeast and eastern frontiers. Okay. So it's a, what they would call an empire, two frontier empire. So it has, in the course between the 16th and 18th, perhaps even 19th century, you see the pressure on both sides, east and west. And the Ottomans were far more powerful, far more numerous in terms of their armies and their demographics. Mm -hmm. Iran, in terms of its resources, could never compete with the Ottoman power, which was much richer, much stronger, mm -hmm. or against the Mughal Empire, which was the richest of all, and the richest of all the empires in the world at the time. In the early modern times, none, no European empire could compete with Mughal Empire in terms of wealth, mm -hmm. okay. population and wealth. Wow. Uh, perhaps only China is the only, otherwise the Indian subcontinent or Mughal Empire of uh, South Asia is the great power. Friend of Iran usually, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. Cultural exchange is a great deal. But nevertheless, the Iranians found themselves between these Sunni pressures on their frontiers. This is the pattern, which is another significant pattern. Iran virtually fought for three centuries against the Ottomans. 
and tremendous cost. And the Ottomans were the aggressors for virtually all the time. They are always in Iran's uh, 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 gateway, mm -hmm. as opposed to Iranians being ever in uh, right. Constantinople, in Istanbul. It's always the reverse mm -hmm. of it. Beyond that, you see that in the 19th century, there is a shift. Because these two powers either decline or disappear. Mm -hmm. What emerges are the European imperial powers in the 19th century. And instead of east-west, it's north-south. Now you see the Russians emerging as an expansionist imperial power mm -hmm. in northern frontiers of Iran, let's say from round about, I mean, if we forget about the earlier episodes from the beginning of the 19th century. And in the south, the British uh, colonial India mm -hmm. that was, had its uh, particular interest in the Persian Gulf for what they would claim to be the security of India. So Iran basically, for, from the beginning of the 19th century, all the way, one might say, with some exaggeration, one might say all the way to the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, has been between these two powers. Not the British in the south disappeared by 1950s, after 1953, yeah. really. But the, the Americans arrived you know, mm -hmm. as a superpower in the Persian Gulf. Uh, they still are, actually. They're very present. And uh, there is a tension in the Persian Gulf between Iran, which always had a claim over the Persian Gulf, mm -hmm. and now the emergence of the uh, Emirates in the southern shores of the Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia, with the support of the Americans, as we see today. Part of it is. In a, in a sense, is a continuity of that old pattern of the North-South. Russia does not have, curiously enough, since 1990s, for the first time, does not have a common border with Iran. Mm -hmm. Because all through the 19th century, all through the period of the Soviet Union, it had the longest land uh, uh, frontiers with Iran, with perhaps Turkey was more or less the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was crucial in, during the Cold War for Iran to be, become an ally of the United States because of this common border for other reasons as well. Mm -hmm. So Iranians has always been conscious of their northern neighbors. And it's not surprised that even today, given the circumstances that we are encountering with the United States emerging as a um, opponent of the Islamic Republic, mm -hmm. there is a tendency on the side of the Islamic Republic to bring back Russia into the game right. in order to maintain that kind of a balance. Right. As late as perhaps a couple of weeks ago, last week, when there was a gathering of Mr. Putin, Mr. Rouhani, and Mr. Erdogan from Turkey in Tehran. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the question was, of course, Syria. But it was more than that. It's basically to try to create a new front against the emergence of, or re-emergence of a hostile United States in the South. Right, right. So that's another important pattern that you see in the shaping of Iran. These are, there are much more that I can name, but sure. these are the most significant that I wanted to point out. Okay, and in terms of um, the, your audience for the book, I'm wondering if you think it would be helpful for foreign policy analysts to mm -hmm. read it. Well, actually, one of the issues while I was writing this book, I was never quite sure whether I was, as the British would say, I was talking to my hat, mm -hmm. or I was writing to some audience somewhere. Sometimes I was thinking, okay, this is my, for my undergrads, okay? If I'm teaching a course called Making of Modern Iran, that's the thing that they would like to know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I said to myself, well, perhaps grad students have to really be my audience. Other times I thought, well, my colleagues, because I have made many arguments here, which is not really the conventional arguments accepted by the scholarship. So there are three audiences already. Then I thought about there is a fair amount of American, Iranian American population in this country. Mm -hmm. It's probably about a few millions now. Uh, or in the English-speaking world, because it's not only this country, it's in Canada, yeah, it's in right. Austri mm -hmm. Australia, in Europe, uh, and English-reading public. 
And they, the new generation, those that were brought up in this country and have this kind of urge to know more about their past, maybe this is something which is of interest to them. And finally, of course, as we approach more and more to the 20th, latter part of the 20th century and 21st century, of course, policymakers, I'm not particularly sure this administration, but I hope generally uh, people would take notice of it. Um, and uh, to my great surprise, uh, I, I, I'm really genuinely saying so, uh, the reviews that I received, I received the review in Economist, in uh, Wall Street Journal, in Sunday Times, as, as you mentioned, Times mm -hmm. of London, um, in New York Review of Books, all of these uh, prove to me that there is a broader policy orientated interest mm -hmm. toward this book because it gives them that if you're dealing with Iran, you are not dealing with Islamic Republic of Iran, but you are dealing with something much deeper, much more culturally uh, nuanced uh, with a um, uh, deep memory mm -hmm. that, is, that goes back in time and has not been um, eroded yet, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow right. uh, with all the problems that Iran is facing mm -hmm. today, environmental problem, economic problems, and so forth. What's going to be? But the fact of the matter is that this kind of uh, presence of Iran should not be purely looked in uh, strategic terms. Mm -hmm. That's important. But this geopolitical strategic Loca locating Iran with its uh, interest in the region around it, it all has historical uh, precedence. Right. The relationship between, for instance, Iran and Iraq, southern Iraq in particular, is a very old one. Uh, ever since the rise of the Safavids and even before that, but in my book, since the rise of the Safavids, in um, uh, 16, um, in 15th and 16th centuries, Iran twice had control of Baghdad. So Baghdad was considered as part of the mm -hmm. uh, Iranian uh, uh, system. And that goes back to the late antiquity, where the capital of the Sasanian Empire of Iran was actually in Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. What is today you see as Baghdad was built on the uh, ruins of the old Sasanian capital. Oh. So it's a very old interaction mm -hmm. between Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau. Uh, with the Persian Gulf the same. Uh, the presence of Iran in the Persian Gulf of course goes to the ancient times, but in the early modern times it's the uh, alternative route that Iran found uh, once the confrontation with the Ottoman Empire closed the Mediterranean mm -hmm. trade route to the interiors of the Mid Middle East, Iran, to the interiors of West Asia, to Iran. And Iran looked into the south and found the connection, or rather the Europeans discovered the southern route and then the Iranians okay. uh, developed that. So in a sense, that kind of a location of Iran also has a long history. Mm -hmm. So what you see that today the Iranians are claiming over the uh, control, or usually it's been the policing of the Persian Gulf, right. has this long history. The same is with the Caspian, by the way, which is people don't hear about it much, right. but it's in the news mm -hmm. because the relationship between Iran, Russia, and all the other republics, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, uh, 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 Georgia, Georgia, all of these around the Caspian mm -hmm. have a long history of how they are dealing with this body of water here and this strategically what is the significance of it because of the oil resources, right. because of the communication between these countries and because of the richness of the Caucasus in that, in that area, which incidentally means Next March, we're having a full conference on the, on the Caspian oh, and significance okay. of the Caspian. We will look forward to that. So, yes, yeah, so the history is ve it's very important to understand the history of Iran when uh, looking at situations yes. today. 
Yeah. So final question. Um, talk about what you conclude in your book. And I'm curious to know your thoughts on how you think the Iranian people would react to your book if yes. given a copy. Thank you. Uh, the conclusion of the book, as I pointed out, throughout you can see almost there is a, there is a chain, there is a uh, line in which I brought poetry, music, uh, uh, artistic expressions by which Iran has always been very proud of. Mm -hmm. It's a culture, Persian is a language of poetry and has well, at least more than a millennium of poetry, mm -hmm. which is very proud of. Um, well, this idea of a poetry, how it changed how it changed Iranians' un ident uh, understanding of themselves. How it actually, from expressions in words, it turned into the expressions into images. Mm -hmm. Because cinema is, is very important in today's Iran. Okay. You know, it's almost kind of replaced poetry. Um, this, I tried to look, to try to take all the way to the end of the book. Uh, throughout the book, I have brought the voices of poets, artists, musicians, singers, um, uh, even popular singers, mm -hmm. cinema filmmakers. It's always there in bits and pieces of it. It's always there. The end of it, I ended with possibly, uh, I mean, everybody, uh, quite a number of reviewers, um, looked at it and said, you know, the, the message that you send at the end of the book is very enigmatic because on the one hand, it's kind of optimistic that this culture is going to survive. On the other hand, you seem to be sending a message that this is a very tragic history, what you see in front of us. Mm -hmm. Well, all histories are tragic, but perhaps Iranian case is a little bit more tragic. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a panel, there was a, a special plenary panel in the Association of Iranian Studies a month ago in Irvine. Mm -hmm. There was a panel, four speakers talked about this book, which was actually quite interesting. It was mm -hmm. very well attended. Everybody came to listen. And uh, one of the speakers who was very praiseful, but had its own perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been filmed. Hopefully, it's going to be on the website of the uh, book on Yale Press. Um, uh, he pointed out that, uh, well, I've read this book, and uh, the thing that most uh, uh, struck me as most significant is that how tragic this history is. And I came out with this verse, which I've actually quoted from a, a poet, that she says, uh, uh, the, uh, he sa she says, um, uh, it's a sorrowful st stroll in the garden of memories. Okay. This is the verse from yes. Furugu Faroksar. And I thought this is a fa fascinating kind of a, uh, summing up what this book is about, all about. Then I went back and they say, oh, I used that actually in the introduction. Okay. That's where I said, after all, when this book is done, this is a sorrowful stroll in the garden of memory. Okay. Then at the end of it, I used another verse uh, by, by her again, by Farouk Farouk. So, uh, and it's quite accidentally, it wasn't meant to be like that, but mm -hmm. she's one of the poets that I'm very fond of. And she says that the, uh, another verse is that the only thing that survives is the voice. Farat tanha sedas ki mimanat in Persian. It's only the voice that survives. And then I ended with a verse from Hafez, which is this great prince of Persian poetry, which is indeed plays around. It's as if Furuk Farasat was. Uh, referring to this verse by Hafez, mm -hmm. in which again the idea is that uh, there is nothing under the uh, skies better than the voice of love. Okay. 
از صدای سخن عشق ندیدم خوشتر از صدای سخن عشق ندیدم خوشتر یادگاری که در این گنبد دوار بماند آن در دیسکلیتنگ آن در دیسروتیتنگ دوم آف دی یونیورس I cannot see a better uh, memory than the voice of love. And I thought, you know, my book is all about political history and economic history and all of that, which gives that actually that sense of a tragedy to mm -hmm. this, what happened to this nation. But still, this voice of love is there. And the ending of it attracted a great deal of attention. Even BBC Persian, uh, which produces a lot of films and stuff, uh, one of their producers made a 20-minute uh, uh, film about this book recently, uh, in which he basically uses that theme at the end of the book and mm -hmm. tries to look back at the course of the 20th century only of the way that the Persian, uh, this Iranian notion of culture has evolved. Mm -hmm and then brings this with music at the end of it, which is, a, is an excellent treatment, actually. It's a very good take on the book. So in effect, what I'm saying is that uh, my, uh, if I want to be a little bit less poetic, my take of this is that, yes, Iran is going through a very troubled period. In the past 40 years, was going through a period of crisis. And if you look back, actually, as this colleague said, there's a plenty of one crisis of their another. Right. Um, but I don't think that purely political crisis is, or other very negative aspects, mm -hmm. are going to basically define this, uh, this uh, political, uh, defines the history of this country. Right. Well, today, more than anything else, uh, ecology is important. Iran is suffering from a very severe uh, water shortage because of the climatic, climatic changes. Mm -hmm. And they're beginning to realize that the real killer is not the United States, is not what they're facing in terms of the all kinds of strategic issues. It's their water, mm -hmm. which they don't have as much. Sure. So these are the new challenges that tend to shape future Iran, and for that matter, the whole of the region. As environmental historians would tell you, environment doesn't recognize boundaries. Right. So it's the whole of the region, let's say from South Asia all the way to the Eastern Mediterranean that it's facing, or whole of North Africa that is facing the same problem. I have enjoyed listening to you talk about your book. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Thank you. I'm glad for the occasion. For more information about Professor Amanat and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you so much. Thank you.